So we'll kick off with the, the first talk is uh, given by Yulia Kotsaruba uh, from York University on uh, do saliency models detect odd one out targets, new data sets and evaluations. Take it away. Well, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, so I'm going to begin with a little bit of motivation for our work. So um, many of you may know that early saliency research was um, driven mainly by psychology and neuroscience. And uh, some of the early models actually tried to explicitly replicate the structure and functionality of the human visual system. However, recently there has been more of a shift towards uh, improving results on benchmarks instead. And as a result of this improvement, some of the deep learning models now demonstrate near human performance. The question we want to ask is whether these saliency models still capture the basic properties of human visual attention as defined by neuroscience and psychology. And we answer this question by proposing two new data sets, one of synthetic and one of natural images, uh, by running a large set of saliency models on these data sets and analyzing the results with respect to features that guide human attention. So we have quite a selection of saliency models. We selected 12 um, classical and eight deep learning models. And we use the Smiler framework to compute all of the saliency maps. By classical models, we mean uh, theory-driven uh, algorithms that explicitly define what saliency is. And many of them do not rely on learning or rely on it very little. Uh, by deep models, we mean the data-driven algorithms that try to establish a link between the, or association between the features in the image and the human fixation data. And these algorithms obviously use learned features primarily. So this is the first data set that we propose. It's called P3, or Psychophysical Patterns. Um, these are some of the examples from it. And uh, uh, it contains 26, almost 2,600 search arrays. Each of them is seven by seven grid, so 49 elements. And one of the elements, a target, is differing by one of the color feature or color orientation or size feature from the distractors. And we provide the pixel-wise um, masks for targets and distractors as well. Um, so here we ask the question, how many targets the saliency algorithms can find? And we use the metric called number of fixations uh, to measure this. So this video shows how the process works. We start with the saliency map. We pick a maximum on it. We check if, it, uh, if it's close enough to the target. And if it's not, then we cover it with a mask and pick the next maximum in the saliency map. And we continue like this iteratively until we either hit the target or uh, the maximum number of fixations is made. So in this case, it's 100. And uh, in this video, the target is not found in the end. So here's some uh, plot that summarizes the uh, results. Um, on the vertical axis, we have uh, the percentage of targets found. And on the horizontal axis, we have the um, uh, labels for the um, saliency algorithms. And the deep learning models are shown with bold uh, labels. Um, so you can see here that classical models outperform the deep models, which are shown, as I said, just uh, in, in bold labels. So most of them are concentrated in the last, um, the la last places on this list. And uh, there are four classical models that detect more than 80% of the targets. But you should keep in mind that this is at 100 fixations, and we have 49 elements in the array. So it means that all of them can basically examine the array twice, which is not what humans would do normally. So if we continue to uh, reduce the number of allowed fixations to 50, then to 25, and then to 15, the performance of all of the models starts to degrade very quickly. And to give you some idea of what humans would do on this type of data, we ran similar analysis on CAT 2000 data set, and we found that human observers can actually find 98% of the targets within 13 fixations or less. And uh, if we put the similar limitation on the saliency algorithms, they only find uh, less than 50% of the targets at 15 fixations. So it's not, um, the, the gap is quite, uh, quite large still. Um, so here are some qualitative results from the data set. These are the images with color targets. And these are the results from the two top uh, classical models. You can see that BMS actually finds all of the targets really well. But M6 struggles with the uh, target in the last row, um, although it should be fairly easy for a human observer to see immediately. Um, these are the results from the two deep learning algorithms, ICF and Silicon. Again, ICF finds the first two targets, fails to highlight the uh, target in the last row, and it's not very clear if Silicon actually gives any preference to any of the targets um, at all. 
So overall, we found uh, through this analysis that majority of the models do not strongly um, uh, respond to uh, color orientation or size features that are known to guide human attention. Uh, majority of the maps were quite noisy, and it took them more than 40 fixations to find the target on average. And uh, we also found that classical models uh, respond to some of the features, but not to all of them equally well. And the best advantage of the uh, classical models is that they're quite predictable. Um, Deep models, on the other hand, are rather inconsistent. So as you just saw in the previous slide, they may uh, uh, show behavior that is opposite to what we expect. So they wouldn't highlight a quite obvious target. And uh, they also show quite large fluctuations of output on very similar looking images. So now onto the second data set, which we call um, odd one out or O3. So this is a set of natural uh, images, 2001 natural images, which were collected um, online. So we didn't take any of them. And uh, there is a single target in each image again. And it can differ by color, shape, size, texture, orientation, focus, or any combination of these features. Uh, it's quite diverse. So there is more than 400 types of everyday objects represented here. And some of the largest categories are flowers, eggs, sweets, um, animals, birds, and so on. And we also provide the pixel-wise um, masks for the targets and distractors here. So again, we want to ask a question, how well the saliency algorithms can discriminate these targets? And we measure it by uh, computing the maximum saliency ratio. So we compute it for target by dividing the maximum target saliency um, by um, maximum distractor saliency. If this value is above 1, we know that the target is pretty well discriminated relative to the distractors. The second uh, uh, measure we compute is MSR for background, which is a maximum background saliency divided by maximum target saliency. And here, if this value is above one, it means that the background is more salient than the target, which means that the model would probably be distracted by something in the background first. So this table shows the results um, for the top three classical and top three deep learning saliency models. So deep learning saliency models, again, are shown in bold. And what we can see from this table is that color targets are actually much easier to discriminate than non-color targets. So um, I highlighted the color targets with um, green here. You can see that all of the values for MSR target are above one, which means that they're discriminated. And uh, the values highlighted uh, with red are for the non-color targets. And most of them are uh, below one. And only one is slightly, slightly above one, which means that um, background attracts uh, sorry, uh, which means that the targets um, uh, are not discriminated well. Um, the second uh, observation is that these models are distracted by the background as well. So highlighted with red are the average MSR background values for these algorithms. And you can see that all of them are significantly above one, except for uh, BMS result, which is slightly above one. Um, Another observation we made was that classical and deep models uh, discriminate only 55 and 45 percent of the uh, targets in the data set. And they also strongly discriminate only 10 and 15 percent of the targets, respectively. Um, as I just pointed out, color targets are easier. So they miss only 30 percent of the color targets. But they miss mo more than 80 percent of the non-color targets, which is not very desirable. So here are some qualitative results. You can see that in the first two rows, um, all models successfully detect the pink pen and the pink flower, but they fail to detect the uh, pretty salient lime among the lemons, and none of them highlight the um, rotated roll of toilet paper, which should be quite obvious, again, to a human observer. So to sum it up, classical models generally perform better on P3 data than O3 data, and there are a couple of models that do well on both data sets. Deep models generally perform better on O3, but not by a huge margin. Uh, we think that um, there are a couple of reasons for this. So one is that a lot of them use transfer learning from the uh, object uh, classification CNN backbones. So it might help um, on O3 data, which is regular objects. Um, and also, O3 is a natural image data set, so it does have a significant center bias. And because these models l learn it eventually, it helps as well. Um, we also found that. Uh, we also found that uh, most models fail to highlight half of the targets in uh, real images, which may have consequences for practical applications of these algorithms in areas such as marketing or advertising. So the next question we want to ask is, um, is this a training data problem? So can we do something with the training uh, uh, of deep learning models to improve their results? 
First thing we looked at was whether common fixation data sets contain any amount of psychophysical and odd one out images. And we found that they actually don't. So CAT2000 data set is the only one that has any portion of them, about 4%, and the rest of the data sets that are commonly used for training contain almost uh, none of uh, such types of data. Um, so next thing we tried is um, to train um, two algorithms that had uh, publicly available training code on our data sets and on different mixtures of the original training data and uh, our new data sets. And then we evaluated them on MIT 1003, P3, and O3. So this table shows the results. Um, we can see that both models actually fail to learn anything from the P3 data alone or when it's mixed with other sources of data. The results are overall quite terrible. It doesn't learn anything at all. And um, better results we get from training on O3 alone. And then the best results are achieved from mixing the uh, original training data with the O3 data. But improvements are actually not very significant. So um, in conclusion, what we did here, we proposed two new data sets and we evaluated 20 state latency models. Uh, despite the fact that benchmarks are getting saturated, majority of these models actually don't capture very fundamental properties of human attention. And uh, we also found that classical and deep models perform rather differently. So classical models are generally better and more consistent on the synthetic P3 images, the types that are used in the human experiments as well. However, we found that all models trail far behind human performance on this data set. Uh, deep models are a little bit better on natural O3 images, but they're inconsistent on all types of data. Uh, we also found that augmenting data sets with P3 or O3 data does not improve the performance of deep models significantly. And it could be, um, it could, like, there are a couple of questions that we want to ask to follow it up. So could it be that we just didn't use enough data? If we use 10,000 images, for example, would it work better? Or could it be that it's a deeper architectural issue? And uh, to this, there are other works in um, similar areas, such as um, same different detection, uh, that also point to that it could be an architectural issue. Um, there is, uh, there's going to be a poster, one, number 179, at the tomorrow's poster session, so I'll be ha happy to answer any questions. And thank you very much for listening. Okay, thank you. Do we have any questions? Yeah. yeah. It's a very interesting show. We'll get, the, uh, get the mic. Thank you for this uh, very interesting talk. So my question is, there was an, an, an image there in your database, which, uh, which were lemons and there was a lime, yeah. but some of the lemons had stickers attached to them and only two of them. So I just, and, and, they, and that was what came up on some of these algorithms. So I'm just wondering, your ground truth, is it, how is it collected? Is it measured experimentally? I mean, w when I looked at this image, m the first attention was the sticker, not the lime. Maybe um, I'm different, but you know what I'm trying to say is that could there be a case that there isn't a unique solution to each of these problems, each um, of these uh, images? Uh, yes, we didn't run a human experiment on these things. We plan to do it. Um, this was uh, three annotators who independently labeled it. So the human observers, well, it was sort of like a very small scale uh, human experiment. I agree that it could be the fact that those stickers could attract attention. In fact, actually, some of the algorithms react to text a lot more than any other feature, so they all went for the text. But I still think that eventually people would look at the green lime, but we saw no response on the green lime at all. So I think that's, a, that's an issue that we're trying to address here. And the fact what people look at would it depend on the, tax, on the task that they are faced with. So for example, if somebody was, I don't know, trying to escape from a fire uh, building, then he would you know, different things would be, uh, he would respond to different things. In other words, for example, a hungry human may respond differently than scared human. That, so there is some bias by the background of the analysis. Um, so, yeah, of course the task has uh, influence, but all of the algorithms that we're using are free viewing. So that was the sort of uh, approach that we took in labeling them. So it's like basically your first gut feeling, you look at the image, what sticks out, this is, this is what we labeled. Uh, obviously, if you ask uh, for a different task, like, I don't know, find an object of particular color, the saliency map would, would look totally different. But we assume no task at all, if it's possible, of course. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, do you have another question? 
Do we have any questions from the other room, from room 104? No, there are no questions. Okay, in that case, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, and our next speaker, while he sits up, um, is Kohai Yamamoto from um, Oki Electrical Industry Company Limited. And he'll be talking on PCAS, pruning channels with attention statistics for deep network compression. Thank you for the uh, interaction. Good afternoon. My name is Kohei Yamamoto, and this project was uh, carried out in collaboration with Cloud Mine from OK Electric Industry. Today, I'd like to talk about our paper, PCAS Pruning Channels with Attention Statistics for Deep Network Compression. The compression neural networks have brought about great advances in many computer vision tasks in several years. Uh, however, the number of parameters required for CNNs tends to be very large, which imposes many uh, memory requirements and uh, computational costs that exceed the capability of mobile and compact devices. In order to ad address this issue, we focus on the terminal pruning approach. The goal of terminal pruning is to prevent accuracy drop while achieving more channel uh, reduction in CNNs. For example of the typical churn pruning strategy, uh, like this, uh, the first it ranks the channels in order of importance with some criterion, and next it prunes the uh, redundant churns with the given per layer compression ratio by given by user, and finally it fine tunes the prune network. Uh, there are two points uh, to consider for channel pruning. The first point is what. Uh, criterion is better for pruning. In previous researches, many criteria have been proposed, such as L1 normal weights, the reconstruction error, or the train trainable scaling factor based approaches, and so on. And second point uh, is how to tune the pareo compression ratios. As mentioned earlier, the typical channel pruning strategy requires the uh, compression ratio for each layer. And it is required to tune the parallel ratios to avoid a large accuracy drop because each layer has a different sensitivity to pruning. And one solution is the sensitivity analysis that needs to analyze the accuracy degradation depending on the number of channels that were deleted. Uh, so this approach needs to uh, set the compression ratios manually and also needs more time for analyzing in proportion to the number of layers. The other solution is based on the reinforcement learning that can select the issues automatically using the uh, trained agent network. And now <clears throat> we propose a noble term pooling strategy uh, based on the attention. Uh, we propose attention statistics as a noble term pruning criterion to estimate redundant channels through optimizing the attention modules. Specifically, the attention module generates a scaling vector from the feature maps, and the vector is channel-wise multiplied by uh, the feature maps again. The load of attention modules is to emphasize channels that contribute to reducing the loss function and to de-emphasize others, de others. For this purpose, uh, we introduced a softmax function in the latter block of the tension modules. By using its property, we also propose a simple technique for converting a given compression ratio for the entire model into the parallel compression ratios. And we named this approach PCAS. Uh, first, I'd like to explain the uh, proposed criteria in detail. To obtain the proposed criteria, firstly, we connect the attention modules to immediately before the pre-trained CNN layers. 
and then train the attention modules simultaneously to minimize the original loss function using the original training data uh, via back propagation. Uh, during training of the attention modules, uh, we fix the weights of all the pre-trained CNN layers. And since uh, the attention modules have dependency after optimization, uh, each, shall, uh, each module can consider the relationships with other layers. Uh, in other words, uh, our criterion, which is generated from the, the modules, uh, can consider the inference for uh, the other layers. Uh, naturally, since the behavior of attention varies according to the input data, it, is, it can not be used as it as a general pooling criterion. Therefore, we define the attention statistics as the quantities found by simply element-wise averaging of the softmax outputs in the attention modules over all training data. Here. <clears throat> Thus, the criterion indicates that more frequently emphasized channels uh, becomes more important. Next, I'd like to describe the technique for automatic parallel layer compilation tuning technique. Uh, for the automatic determination, it is required to evaluate the redundancy of each layer. Therefore, we expect the softmax distribution to flatten as the number of important channels increases. For example, in case of the flat distribution, the corresponding layer has low redundancy because many turns are contributed to the accuracy. Yes. And in contrast, if the distribution is heavily biased, um, <clears throat> I mean not flat uh, like this, yeah. uh, its layer has high redundancy because only some of the channels are important. Uh, based on this assumption, we propose a technique to prune chance of the more biased distribution preferentially. Uh, specifically, we define the global threshold T as a controller for all the thresholds of each layer on the extension statistics and optimize it to minimize the difference uh, between a given compression ratio, uh, given compression ratio and uh, <coughs> and the global compression ratio that can be derived from the uh, global threshold here. Uh, after the optimization, by using the optimal global threshold, we can convert a given compression ratio into the power layer compression ratios uh, using this. And uh, channels from more biased distribution are preferentially selected as a pruning target. So far, I have explained our pro uh, proposed approach PCAS using the attention for channel pruning. Now I'd like to turn to the performance evaluation. We first evaluated the proposed method PCAS against the uh, C410 and uh, C410 and the imaginative sets and the various models uh, in comparison with conversion of channel pruning methods for the object recognition task. Uh, for convergence, uh, we measured the number of floating point operations, uh, I mean flops, and the total number of parameters, as well as the variation, variation accuracy. As a result, uh, PKS uh, outperformed the conventional methods that were based on the normal weights, the reconstruction error, and <clears throat> the reinforcement learning, and achieved the network with the fewest parameters and flops. And it's here. Next, we perform uh, evaluation on segment model on Canvid dataset for semantic segmentation task. And this table shows uh, the results in comparison with the reinforcement learning based method. Uh, we confirmed that PCAS was able to exceed about 10% uh, reduction in numbers of parameters compared with the conventional methods uh, that had the same level of accuracy and the variations in crops. We also analyzed the optimized attention modules for investigating the behavior of the, our proposed criteria. 
And this uh, figure shows nine attention statistics corresponding to the channels in each conversion layer in VZZ10 model. On the data sets of uh, CIFR10 with uh, blue line and the CIFR100 in uh, green line. Please look at the uh, second layer one, two. Yes. Uh, it has a shape that is closer to flat than other distributions. And we can see it as the uh, low redundancy layer. Uh, on the other hand, the final layer for two, and uh, this, uh, was uh, heavily biased, and we found it clearly redundant. By comparing the results of CIFR 10 and CIFR 100, we also confirmed that the redundancy contained in the trans VZZ 10 model differs depending on the complexity of the problem. For example, uh, from layer 4 1, uh, this, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, this. Um, it is clear uh, that the CIFR 10 distribution is more biased than the CIFR 100, and the importance of some channels is high. Uh, in contrast, the CIFR 100 distribution is only weakly biased, with other channels also contributing the accuracy. And this result shows our idea has the potential to consider the relationship between the model and the data set. Uh, we also performed the uh, operation study about the training schemes and the module architectures for the ResNet 18 model on the CIFR 10 data set. Uh, first one is about the parameter fixed training for attention modules. The green line is in the, in the figure and show the pattern in the non-fixed case was inferior to the, that in the fixed case. Then next, we variated the difference between our module and squeeze and excitation module, which is uh, used in SENET, you know. And in contrast to the proposed tension modules using the softmax function. Uh, but uh, the SE modules independent, independently apply the sigmoid function to the channel, uh, each channel. From the results, we confirmed that the SE modules were inferior to the parameter fixed case of the uh, proposed method. Uh, I'd like to conclude my presentation. Uh, we propose attention statistics, a novel attention-based criterion for channel pruning to estimate redundant channels via optimizing the appended neural networks we call attention modules. And <clears throat> we present a simple technique that it requires only one compression ratio, which can be converted into the Pareja ratios. And we evaluated our approach on various models, and the results show promising pruning performance on also various data sets. Uh, thank you very much. OK, do we have any questions? Okay. Uh, thank you for the talk. Just one question about uh, so if you have uh, if we want to do transfer learning with this new uh, pruned uh, network, does the result still hold? Like, uh, is there a gain or loss in the performance of the network? Uh, transfer learning. Uh, what I, what I was asking is that if if you had made any experiments with the transfer learning to see if the result uh, of the network uh, the performance of the network network is still holds in the case of transfer learning for example you have a pruned data set and now uh, you want to tr uh, you have trained it on ImageNet for example and now you want to test it on another data set uh, is there a gain or loss in the performance in this case with the new uh, Pruned uh, network. Uh, I I I don't have experiment and the transfer learning, so uh, I <laughs> yeah yeah um, sorry I'm, <laughs> I have no um, answers. Okay, any other questions? Yeah, one at the back there. <laughs> 
Hi, uh, thank you for the talk. Um, just one quick question. Um, I actually really like slide 16. If you can go back to slide 16. Yeah, so can we, I don't know how many networks you tried this on, but can we say that like the later layers have higher redundancy than earlier layers based on this diagram here? Meaning yeah. that later layers are actually a lot more um, redundant, I guess? Yeah. Okay, cool. Have you tried this on, for example, maybe ResNets where the channels are actually dependent across multiple layers and seeing what the redundancy is across there? Uh, yeah, for ResNet 15 class model, the, the result, ana analyzing the result. Okay, so you, you see similar patterns with ResNet as well? Uh, you, you mean, you mean uh, how, how, the, uh, how about the, uh, this is uh, the more, more deeper model? The, the behavior is, what, what, what behavior is it? And <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Uh, I tried uh, the ResNet 15 model, and the uh, tension, tension is, uh, uh, distributions, uh, the uh, difference between from this and uh, uniformly uh, mm, uh, biased the distribution we get we uh, confirmed, and uh, <laughs> and I. Uh, I, mm, it, it, it's difficult to explain this, sorry. <laughs> oh, okay, thank yeah, you, thank you. Okay, do you have any questions from the other room? No, we don't. No, okay. Okay, uh, I think in that case, thank the speaker again. Thank you very much. Our next speaker, um, Takumi Kobayashi, from the National Institute of Advanced Industrial Science and Technology, uh, on large margin in softmax cross entropy loss. Thank you. Thank you for the introductions. Uh, hi, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, and, uh, the title of this talk is Large Margin in the Source Max Cross Entropy Loss. In this talk, I present why the Source Max Loss works quite well and how to improve it from the uh, viewpoint of the uh, classifier margin. The classifier margin is a key measure to estimate the generalization performance of the classifiers. So the large margin classifier is a hot research topic in machine learning and pattern recognition research fields. And so uh, in particular, uh, the SVM would be the uh, most successful and famous large margin method. And the classifier margin is also related to the classifier loss and uh, as in the uh, SVM, the hinged loss was employed to train the large margin classifiers. Then in this decade of the deep learning era, uh, instead of using the hinged loss, the source mark cross entropy loss is widely employed to train the deep neural networks. Uh, it is derived from the posterior probabilistic model uh, so, for the case of the classifications, the CNN produces the logits uh, denoted by F, and uh, uh, the, those logits are transformed through the soft mass transformations to the posterior probabilities, like this. And uh, soft max loss works very well, even without carefully considering the classifier margin, unlike the SVM. So, we can construct the softmax loss simply by comparing the uh, posterior probabilities with the ground tooth one hot label vector, like this. And in this case, the loss focuses on the uh, target logit, which is denoted by Fy, which corresponds to the uh, ground tooth label Y. So there are some works to incorporate the uh, large margin flavor into the softmax loss for training the large margin neural networks. There are previous works uh, directly manipulate the logic scores to underestimate the target logic score denoted by Fy. The previous works uh, 
uh, so the, in the previous works, unfortunately, such a direct manipulation of the logic score requires a carefully designed training strategies like curriculum learning, which requires uh, also uh, careful uh, tuning for the training uh, procedures. In contrast these to these uh, previous works, we analyzed the softmax loss itself to find out the large margin effect in the, in the softmax loss. And they, uh, through this analysis, we proposed a simple regularization method to enhance the large margin effect in this softmax loss and eventually to provide large margin neural networks. The point is, our method does not directly touch the logic scores so uh, it naturally over overestimates the non-target logic scores. So it is simply embedded into the existing scene in the frameworks. So first, uh, let me begin with the uh, margin-based loss formulations. Uh, suppose we have much class classification task of C classes given the classification logics denoted by F where the target logic is FY for the ground tooth level Y. And the general formulation for the margin-based classification loss is defined by this, where the classification margin is measured between the target uh, logic FY and the maximum of the non-target logic, which is denoted by FC star. And it contains the measuring function L and uh, as well as the uh, margin bias denoted by the rho. For example, the match class SVM proposed by Graham and Zinger in 2001 is actually realized by employing the hinge functions for the measuring functions and the uh, margin bias of one. And please note that this margin bias is uh, working like a lower bound for the classification margin, so we want to possibly increase this margin bias. Then uh, let's go through the reformulation of the softmax loss uh, by step by step, which is the main part of the work. The softmax loss is defined by the negative log of the target posterior, which is transformed like this. And it is further reformulated into this form through some algebraic transformations. This is close to the margin-based loss, where there are, we employed source plus as our measuring functions. And the most important part is this log sum exponential function term, this uh, LS, uh, called the LSE. This LSE exhibits the larger values even than the uh, maximum because it has these relationships regarding the maximum values. This relationship can be obtained by decomposing these LSC functions into the maximum part and the non-negative residual part. And by putting, uh, back, putting this back into the softmax loss, we can finally get this uh, uh, loss uh, this kind of reformation of the softmax loss, which is nothing but a, a large mar margin-based classification loss, where uh, more importantly we get uh, margin bias uh, by like these forms. So for the larger margin classifier, we want to enlarge this margin bias, but uh, how can we do that? For that purpose, we propose a regularization method like this. Please recall the property of the LSC functions, which is upper bounded by the log of Siemens 1, where the equality holds by uniform logics. So we can say that the margin bias is dependent on the distribution of non-target logics. That is, uh, the uh, uniformity of the logics is affecting the classified margin. Actually, the scattered logits produce the smaller uh, margin bias. On the other hand, the uniformly distributed logits produce the larger margin bias. It leads to larger classifier margin. 
so we can propose the regularization method to encourage the uniformity of the losses. In this case, the uniformity is measured by employing the symmetrical divergence between the soft mass posterior of the non-target losses and the uniform properties. By minimizing this divergence, we can get a uni close to uniform non-target losses. So this is the final, pro uh, final uh, uh, loss functions of the proposed method, which contains the soft max loss as well as the regularization term with the regularization parameter lambda. It is also compared to the previous methods uh, in terms of the margin barriers. Uh, the point is that our proposed method overestimate the non-target logic, while the uh, pre previous ones underestimate the uh, target logic. And there is an interesting connection to the level smoothing organizations, LSR. LSR was proposed in the 1980s and is recently rediscovered by inception model for training the these mineral networks. It degrades the ground tooth level by adding the uniform uh, level noise like this, and uh, it provides the uh, loss of this form. And we can see that there is a uh, 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 care divergence like uh, ours, so we can say that LSR also contributes to the large margin neural networks by encouraging the uniformity of the logics. But uh, please note that LSR degrades the ground tooth levels uh, in contrast to the ours. Uh, in the experiments, we apply the proposed method to the 13 layer CNN on the CIFR, uh, CIFR 100 dataset. And this is the regularization study for comparing the uh, regularization forms uh, to the uh, two asymmetric uh, KL divergence. And we can see that the proposed symmetric KL divergence uh, stably produces a favorable performance improvement. And the proposed method is also compared to the level smoothing organizations. And the LSR actually improves the performance, but in the LSR, we have to tune the uh, organization parameter carefully because the LSR actually degrades the uh, ground tooth level. Uh, and uh, the, more the more interesting point is in the right hand figures which shows their margin bias throughout the training epochs. The soft mark loss of the blue club uh, monotonically decreases the margin bias. On the other hand, ours of the red club and the LSR of the uh, green one uh, adaptively increase their margin bias to provide a large margin neural networks. Then the proposed uh, large margin neural networks are also robust to some sort of degraded training sets, uh, such as on the smaller number of training samples or the noisy training levels, where the uh, ground tooth levels are randomly flipped. And this is due to the uh, good generalization performance of the large margin method. Finally, we show the com uh, performance comparison to the other large margin loss methods. The large margin, uh, the large margin source max loss uh, denoted by LGM and LSM are somewhat difficult to apply to the large, large scale CNNs, even by employing the uh, training strategies suggested by the authors. On the other hand, our proposed method is uh, favorably uh, producing the uh, uh, good performance improvement uh, due to the simple regularization methods. Conclusions are uh, in this work through the analysis on the soft math loss in terms of the class file margins. We propose a simple uh, but uh, novel regularization methods to and larger margin of the neural networks. And the proposed method is uh, not directly working on the uh, logic score, so uh, our proposed method is simply embedded into the existing CNNs without further modifying the other components except for the loss part. 
and we show that it, uh, the proposed method produces good performance on bare CNNs and bare storing datasets. Thank you for your listening. Okay, thank you. Do we have any questions? Any questions from the other room? No, there are no questions. Uh, I don't think I have any questions. Oh, you got one? Good. So, uh, thank you. Uh, could you show us the, the equations again? The... Um, where you compared uh, this back, 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 back. You compared, a, I think it was like a couple of slides, with this one, right. So um, what prevents you from enforcing even stronger bias margin? I mean, could you, you have a parameter there that tells you, um, uh, uh, I have only, long, only one parameter for the regularization parameters. Yeah. Yes. How does it impact the margin uh, bias? Yes. Uh, maybe this one. Uh, the, yep. uh, right for the axis means there are various regularization parameters, and we can see that uh, by... Uh, you can see that the proposed method produces good performance on large part, large variety of the regularization parameters in contrast to the LSR. Okay, and how, how do you select that parameter? Uh, in actually, we selected the uh, parameter of 0 0.3, which, which, are, uh, which shows good performance on various CNNs, uh, and this is empirically determined. Okay, and it's similar to different CNNs, or it varies depending on the CNN? Uh, what, what do you mean? Is, is the value of this parameter roughly similar for different nets? Uh, yes. Y yes, I tried the... Uh, yes, uh, in this experiment, we consistently applied the uh, parameter of 0 0.3. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your questions. Okay, thank you very much. Thank the speaker again. Okay, our next speaker is Zoltan Milakshi from Jotvos Lorand University. We're speaking on differentiable unrolled alternating direction method of multipliers for one net. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Zoltan Milachki. The title was already said, but I repeat it. Differentiable unrolled alternating direction method of multipliers for one net. This is a joint work with my PhD supervisor, Andras Lorenz from Eltautvishlora University and with Barnabas Potsos from Carnegie Mellon University. So the first slide is uh, an overview of, of the procedure. So basically our method is, is, a, is a, the combination of two previously published methods. One of them is one network and the other one is unrolled optimization. What one network uh, does is that it basically uh, projects uh, points back and forth between a hyperplane and uh, a natural uh, image set and it is uh, compatible with multiple such hyperplanes. These correspond to linear inverse problems. We'll see that in a moment. And uh, one downside of this method is that the red projections are trained independently from the green projections. So we will see that this leads to convergence issues. So when we realized that, we started looking in the literature and found that uh, <clears throat> there is a method that actually does this end-to-end. This is unrolled optimization, so you can see here that, that there are solid and dashed uh, uh, red uh, mappings between the two sets, and this is trained. Then the solid ones are trained end to end, but unfortunately, this one only supports a, a single linear problem, so just one hyperplane in contrast to the multiple ones. And then our procedure is the combination of the two, so we use multiple hyperplanes and, uh, and end to end learning. In the bottom right corner, you can see an example 
for the output of our method. So basically what it does is that it takes many noisy images uh, which where the noise is actually defined by by the by the hyperplanes and then our method is is just one single deep network that is able to denoise uh, all of these type of problems so that is the big picture and now let's dive into the details so our starting point is the linear inverse problem which is defined by by this equation uh, basically what happens here is that we take an image X star, we vectorize it, so we take its pixels, multiply it by a matrix A n, so this will mix up the pixels, and uh, we can add some noise to it, and then we get a noisy measurement Y n. And then the task is the, is the inverse problem, so given Y n and A n, we need to recover X star n. So given a noisy measurement, we need to find the original noiseless image. Um, when A is uh, under complete or overdetermined, so when there are more, more rows than columns in it, uh, the solution is just the least squares problem, but uh, when uh, the matrix has more columns than rows, this is the overcomplete case. Um, the solution, there are actually infinitely many solutions, and then uh, the question arises, how do we choose from these solutions? So basically, we get a hyperplane, and we do not know which point to choose from this hyperplane. And some well-known examples uh, of this problem are in-painting, super-resolution, and compressive sensing. So these uh, problems can all be cousin in this form. The only difference is the definition of the matrix A and So, um, uh, getting back to the previous question, how do we choose uh, one point from from uh, the hyperplane? So the <clears throat> idea is that most points uh, on the hyperplane will not be actually uh, real images. So if we define a predefined set of images, we can try to find a point that is contained in both the valid images and both in the hyperplane. So in that sense, we can try to find the, the intersection point of the two sets. And this is reflected in this objective. So the first point will try to fit the hyperplane. Uh, so the first objective will try to fit the hyperplane. And the second objective uh, will try to fit the predefined set. Uh, this function phi is called uh, the signal prior, and notice that it's independent from the index n. And uh, traditionally, this function phi was hand-designed, so it was analytically derived. <clears throat> and uh, one notable special case for that is, is wavelet sparsity, so for that, this is the definition. So um, once we know that we need to find the intersection of, of the two sets, uh, the question arises, how do we actually find that intersection point? So the trivial solution would be to start from a random point in the hyperplane and project it to the set, and then project back to the hyperplane and back to the set, and so on. So we can uh, employ an alternating uh, projection method. This is called uh, ADMM. I'm sure many of you know that. Uh, so how uh, ADMM is derived is that we basically take the augmented Lagrangian of, of the previous objective and we perform variable splitting. So given the three variables, we can uh, optimize uh, in just that single variable one at a time. And then we get these update rules. Uh, actually, the colors are uh, corresponding to the figure. So, so the X update is, is red here and also red on the figure, and the Z and the U update is, can be treated as just one projection to the hyperplane. That's, uh, that's the green update. So uh, the thing that we should notice here is that the function phi is independent from the matrix A, and this will enable us to learn uh, the function phi instead of predefining it. So that's exactly what one network does. Uh, it, the authors uh, in the paper proposed to pre-train an adversarial autoencoder that takes a noisy image as input and uh, outputs its noise as counterpart. So they, they kind of pre-train this method, and then once it's pre-trained, they just plug it in into the X update. Uh, the benefit of this method is that it uh, outperforms wavelet sparsity and uh, it is also a multitask learning problem. So you can vary the matrix A and still use the same deep network to solve multiple problems. 
these problems can be very different. Um, the downside is, like I said, that uh, the red steps are trained independently from the green steps. So in that sense, it's not an end-to-end -end trained architecture and this leads to severe convergence issues. Um, so uh, in contrast to that, one world optimization performs end-to-end -end training. Uh, as you can see you now, all, all the updates are red, so they are trained together, as you can see in the equation as well. Uh, this is a supervised type of thing, so you are trying to get an optimal result by the final iteration. And uh, the downside is that they are just using a single uh, linear operator A, so that's fixed for for all the different images, while in our case, in one and in one net, it's it's different for every single image. Uh, nevertheless, <clears throat> the good side is that uh, by performing this joint training, a much smaller iteration count should be sufficient in contrast to the original procedure. So our contribution is that we merge uh, these two frameworks. You can see the update rules here and the figure here. I don't want to go into the details now anymore. Um, so we do use the same deep net uh, in, v together with multiple uh, instances of the matrix A and we perform end-to-end -end training. So this way, in contrast to one net which sees X star plus M, so this noisy image, uh, we actually deal with uh, Z minus U which is uh, actually encountered in ADMM. So, so this should be a, a much more stable procedure than the original one net. And hence, we would expect that a much smaller iteration count should, should be sufficient compared to one net, which can take up to 300 iterations. Here is the experimental setup. Uh, we compare uh, to two baselines, Wavel or the original one net procedure and wavelet sparsity in terms of uh, PSNR and ADMM iteration count. We consider four uh, linear inverse problems, pixel-wise in painting, denoising, scattered in painting, block-wise in painting, and super resolution. We, we evaluate over 500 test images, and we employ the following network architecture, uh, both in one network and both in our version. Uh, I don't want to get into the details of that. It's, it, uh, on a high level, this is just a standard conv net with, with some special activation functions. Um, um, we also use Adam Optimizer with uh, t equals eight unrolled iterations for our method, and uh, we tested uh, uh, on MS Celeb 1M and uh, ImageNet both datasets resized to 64 by 64. So, so here are the quantitative results. Uh, you can see that our method uh, uh, achieves uh, really good PSNR scores, in many times better ones than the original procedures. Uh, while also using a smaller iteration count. So for example, consider uh, this case when uh, just by changing the training procedure, the result of the original one that was boosted from 24 to 28, while the iteration count was reduced from 222 to just eight. So the big picture is that either method either wins or at least is competitive with the original procedures, but uh, with a, a significantly greatly reduced iteration count. Um, and here are some uh, uh, test images that uh, can be uh, seen for uh, visual purposes. So again, here are the linear inverse problems that we considered, so we need to denoise these images. And here are the denoised uh, results of our method. This is, these are the results for the original one network, and this is for wavelet sparsity. And the big picture is that uh, our method uh, yields visually appealing images while the, pre while the other two methods can yield some very, very weird mistakes. So for, so for example, here at the nose uh, or here at the forehead. Uh, the same picture holds on ImageNet. So our method generates semantically correct images, even if not that sharp, but still better images than the two baselines. So the take home message is that we propose a combination of unrolled optimization and one network that supports multiple uh, linear inverse problems and end-to-end -end differentiable ADMM. Uh, the obtained method either outperformed or tied the original one network procedure while using a much smaller iteration count. 
and clearly our method is a step towards multitask learning. So remember that we use the same uh, single deep network with multiple instances of the ADMM method. So in that sense, we can use the same deep network to solve multiple very, very different problems. And uh, in particular, our method is uh, useful when, when storing uh, multiple large uh, uh, weight matrices of deep networks is infeasible. So that happens mostly on mobile devices and edge computing. So in that sense, we can only store just one network. And here are some uh, possible future extensions to dense operators, large, larger image sizes, video data. Uh, learned data steps and adversarial performance measures. I actually have results for video and learned data steps and they are very encouraging, but these are unpublished yet. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much for your attention. The source code will be uh, fairly available soon uh, at the GitHub URL. It's implemented in TensorFlow. And if you have any questions, please ask me here in person or by email. Thank you. Okay, do we have any questions? No. Any questions from the other room? No, there are none. No. Did you want to? <laughs> okay, go on then. Uh, okay, so a very interesting talk. So the, my question is, uh, would you see an extension of that to problems that maybe cannot be presented by this um, Linear combination yes. and um, so uh, I've been thinking about that, and uh, the obvious extension would be to make nonlinear uh, inverse problems, uh, and uh, there is work on that. Uh, I didn't uh, experiment with that, but uh, uh, if you look up in the lit literature, you will find it. So one example uh, would be like the standard deep net problems. So for example. Um, what you typically see in supervised learning, you can think about that as a kind of nonlinear inverse problem. Uh, so in that sense, this is a limitation of our method because it it's, uh, it's, uh, makes the scope of the paper smaller. But uh, still, this, this uh, formalism is, is uh, quite general. So really, that matrix A can be anything. You can uh, either even uh, colorize images with that and so on. Okay, thank you. Very, very good talk. Any other questions? Okay, we thank our speaker again. Okay, okay and our next speaker, uh, Seung Kyun Lee. Seung Hyun Lee. Okay, thank you. Uh, Graph-based knowledge distillation by multi-head attention network. Uh, please take it away. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Seung Hyun Lee, and my advisor is Professor Byung Chul Song. We are from Ina University in Korea. The paper title is Graph-based knowledge distillation by multi-head attention network. Yeah. Yeah. The contents are like this. First, I will explain what is the knowledge distillation and point out the problem of conventional method. And I will introduce our proposed algorithm to solve the problem and experimental result. Uh, yeah. CNNs have been successfully used in various fields. However, its huge computing and memory costs make them hard to adjust to the real world. For reducing the cost while maintaining the performance, various attempts have been made up to now. For example, network pruning, quantization, and knowledge distillation. Knowledge distillation's purpose is to achieve optimal performance from small student network by distilling and transferring large network knowledge. Actually, distilled knowledge can be applied to not only light weighting, but various purposes such as damage provided running and transfer running. So we think that it's more useful than other light weighting schemes. Based on our survey, knowledge distillation methods are usually composed of three parts, selecting, distilling, and transferring knowledge. I will explain each component in detail now. First, we define the teacher, teacher network information as teacher knowledge. Teacher knowledge should be effective in enhancing student network. 
This can be done by extracting the teacher network feature or just determine the way for distillation. Most famous algorithm for each category is Softlogic, Hinton's Way, and Finnet, FSP, and RKD. Next, selecting rules is distilled. For this, smoothing, color method, or some neural layers are applied. In case of multiple connection, the Finnet compares the feature map as is, and the AT made attention map using sensed feature map, and the VID <coughs> extracted variation information in feature maps. Finally, distilled rules is transferred. There are two approaches to do this. The first one is initialization and fine tuning. After initializing the student network, it can quickly achieve higher performance. Also, once initialized, it can be used for various purposes, like imaging the pre-trained network. However, if training time becomes strong, teacher knowledge may vanish. The second approach is multitask learning. By transferring the teacher knowledge continuously, the, <laughs> the student network can be more improved. However, training time is much longer than the previous method. This is the pro procedure to distill the teacher knowledge. Most of the previous method focus on second component, here, distilling knowledge. However, we had a concern here. Is the conventional knowledge the teacher network uh, assenting knowledge? Most of the previous methods focused on how to distill knowledge, not what to distill. In case of neural response, multi connection, and shared representation knowledge, they sense some feature in neural networks and just try to change battery or corner or sensing points and so on. However, there's no acceptable knowledge, which can be used as the neural network's assenting knowledge. Recently, interdata relation knowledge has been proposed. However, it is not enough because most of them only focus on the relation in the last embedded space. We found that this problem is due to the inconsistency between selected knowledge and neural network's purpose. The neural network's goal is to map high dimensional complex data on the low dimensional space for easier analysis. For example, in classification task, the neural network can map same class data onto same po uh, similar position and separate from other class data. This is called embedding, and we believe the knowledge has to represent this. Most of the method, uh, most of the method is in interdata relation knowledge focus on the last embedded space here. However, we know an, an excellent teacher teaches not only the answer, but the procedure of solving a problem. As a result, we assume that the, the assenting neural network knowledge is an embedding procedure, and we select the embedding procedure as a knowledge to distill and transfer. Next, I will, I will introduce the module for distilling, uh, distilling embedding procedure knowledge, which is called multi-head graph distillation. For distilling the embedding procedure knowledge, we have, compute the, we have to compute the relation between feature map. However, the feature map relation is hard to apprehend, so we build a module by single value decomposition, SVD, and attention network. Also, to achieve state-of-the-art performance, we transfer the knowledge by multi-task learning. First, we compress the feature map by SVD. Feature map can be treated as a set of feature vectors. So when SVD is applied, single vectors contain the most important information in feature maps. However, single vectors have bad properties to transfer, so we apply specific post-processing algorithm. The bad properties and post-processing were described in our previous paper here. Next, we train the multi-head attention network to this embedding procedure knowledge between two sensed points, front-end and back-end single vectors. Each module contains an estimator and some attention heads. The estimator predicts back-end single vectors using front-end single vectors, and attention heads in the estimated feature vectors to make it easy to predict back and single vectors. Train the attention head computes the relation between front end and back end single vectors. It means that they give high attention to front end single vectors, which are stored for estimating back and single vectors. 
and embedded, embedded in a similar position. So the attention head can extract information about the embedding procedure between two sensed points in the neural network. The attention, uh, sorry, the embedding procedure knowledge is formed by a graph structure, so we call this graph-based knowledge. The graph-based knowledge is transferred to the student network by multi-task learning. We apply graph gradient clipping to adaptively control the teacher's constraint without over-constraint. The detail of this is also described in our previous paper here. This figure shows our overall algorithm. We extract a feature map uh, we, we extract a feature map from multiple points in neural network and put them into multi-head graph distribution module. The module compresses compress feature map using SVD and this is the graph-based knowledge using attention head. Finally, the student run its task with the crit teacher's knowledge. Yeah. In experiment, we evaluated our algorithm by four network architectures and two data sets. We use four comparative methods, including the activation boundary, which is one of the, one of the state of the art. This figure shows the network architectures. And for tiny MiGenet, one morphing layer or stride is added. To prove our origin more clearly, we did experiment for KDSVD app. KDSVD app is very similar to KDSVD and proposed method, but it does not compute the relation of singular vectors. Compare, just compare the difference between teacher and student singular vector as is. So they are, uh, they are categorized by multi-connection, shared representation, and embedding procedure knowledge, respectively. Experimental results show that our method outperformed the others. So uh, it means that our knowledge, the embedding procedure knowledge, is better than others. Even though transferring teacher knowledge to heterogeneous students, the proposed method outperformed the others. Moreover, in case of ResNet, both of these distillation modules failed to improve student network. However, the proposed method improves the student network more than 1%. Therefore, we can say that our algorithm extracts more general knowledge Independent, independent with network architectures. The number of attention heads is related to the quantity of knowledge. When more heads are used, the performance will be increased. However, if two main heads are used, it causes over constraint and performance may decrease. So selecting the right number of heads is very important. Moreover, we are using the code of our method as well as the compared method with more experimental results. These results show that our method makes the student train faster. This deep dark green line is our method. Uh, train faster and better, including the DML and RKD. In conclusion, we analyzed and point out the fundamental problems of previous knowledge distribution method. Also, to solve this, we proved post the embedding process in knowledge, which is close to common ugly theory and algorithm to distill it. Thank you for your attention, and you can find the code I said in this, this uh, address and QR code. Yeah. Thanks, okay. Thank you. Do we have any questions? Any questions from the other room? You've gone home. Okay. Um, could you just go back a slide um, or two? Yeah. So, so um, I don't. This isn't an area I know anything about. But that that big jump in the um, uh, accuracy you, you uh, mean around jump? yeah around yeah. thirty epochs. What's what's that about? Usually we decrease running rate in some points, right? So this point mean decrease. Uh, Learning rate decreasing point. So I decrease learning rate in this point and this point and this point. Okay, so you're changing a parameter as it's learning. Yeah. And it's yeah. jumping up. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. So speak again.
you ready? Okay. Okay, our next speaker, Marvin Teichmann, uh, from the University of Cambridge, speaking about convolutional CRFs for semantic segmentation. Hi everyone, my name is Marvin, and I'd like to present to you my work about convolutional CRFs. Um, this work, I, I've done this work um, in the Computer Vision Lab at the University of Cambridge under the supervision of Roberto Schipola. I guess most of you guys are familiar with the semantic segmentation task. For those of you who don't, the goal of this task is to assign a discrete class label for each pixel in an image. In this particular example, taken from the Pascal VOC dataset, um, the task involves to distinguishing between airplane and background. How would you go, uh, go about this when, do, uh, when doing this kind of cast nowadays? Well, it's pretty easy. You take an off-the-shelf CNN network from somewhere, you apply it, and usually you get pretty good results. I say pretty good because as you can see, they're usually not perfect, especially when it comes down to fine-grained details. Um, you will see that the segmentation network is somewhat off. This has some architectural um, reasons. I don't kind of uh, want to detail it, but at least as a human, you would be able to easily spot it. And even without any kind of semantic knowledge about the object, just by following some edges and blobs, you'd be able to basically get a better, um, better segmentation. So the question would be, why not doing a machine learning approach to exactly do this and take an existing segmentation and make it better? And this is where CRF, conditional random fields, come into play. CRFs are uh, models which are really good in refining existing predictions. How do they do it? CRFs are probabilistic graphical models which are able to learn and represent relationships between predictions, pixels, observations, or whatever you kind of input you have. Uh, refining existing predictions is one big application, but there are many more applications. Uh, CRFs have successfully been used uh, for things like weekly supervised learning, uh, for integrating contextual or uh, and external knowledge, and uh, even for hierarchical and instance-based tasks. So how, how do sigma, uh, CFs work? In the field of um, computer vision and semantic segmentation, CRF are usually formulated as a Gibbs distribution over an energy function consisting of a unary and a pairwise potential. The unary potential is isomorphic to the initial course prediction, so it's essentially the initial course prediction, while the pairwise potential is a function which depends on each pair of pixels and, it, and its predicted values and the color uh, values of the image. The energy function is the sum of the unary and the pairwise, and to, in order to perform inference in a CRF, we minimize the energy. What happens in practice is that there is some kind of fight going on between the unary and the pairwise. So the unary is basically zero or minimal if the CRF just outputs the initial cost prediction, while the pairwise potential, which is definite between two pixels, can model relationships such as two pixels should have the same or similar class value if they are close together and have the same color. So sometimes the pairwise potential likes to flip a class, while the unary potential always wants to stay the same. So um, by doing kind of all the minimization, at some point you get a solution, which is mostly the unary, but flips a minimal amount of pixels in order to also satisfy as much as possible of the pairwise constraints. Um, the most widely used versions of CRFs are the versions provided and suggested by Quienbo and Kalten at the NIPS 2011. These 
this CRF version uses two types of pairwise potentials, or pairwise potentials based on two types of features, the position-based and the color-based features. It essentially, what it essentially does is what I've already motivated. Uh, position-based features say predictions should have a similar class if they're close together. Color-based features say predictions should have a similar class if they have similar color. One of the main contribution of Quinn, Bull, and Carlton is to figure out how inference can be done efficiently inside such a model. Um, towards this goal, they use the mean field approximation algorithms. Algorithm. Most steps in, the, in this algorithm, the mean field inference, are trivial. The one exemption, ex, exemption is the message passing, which uh, basically depends on the pairwise potential. And as you might already guess, since the pairwise potential is a function of each pair of pixels, it's actually very difficult to compute. So in order to compute it, what they do is, um, uh, in order to compute the message passing, they're using the Pyramidal Hill lattice approximation, a high-dimensional filtering algorithm which uh, reduces complexity. It was really good at this times. There is a bit of an issue in modern, uh, basically nowadays, since this Pyramidal Hill lattice approximation is based on very sophisticated data structures. Sophisticated data structures are amazing on CPU, but you want to work on the GPU, and GPU like simple linear algebra. Um, so compared to modern uh, algorithms, the fully connected CFs have a couple of problems. They are very slow. And slow, I mean um, basically up to one second slow, which was fi fine back then. But nowadays, we, ha now we have really good CNNs, which are able to process videos in real time, get good simulation, so we don't want to spend one second refining. And what's even more worse, um, when you train a deep learning network, you, want, you need to iterate over the training data a million of times. You can't afford one second computation time for inference. You never get it trained. CRFs are notoriously hard to optimize. Actually, or train, uh, when I say optimize, I mean train in this uh, setting. Training CRF is still an open research problem. There are suggestions for quadratic optimization. There are suggestions for approximate inference. In fact, Deep Lab, the segmentation approach, which uses CRFs, just do a grid search to get some parameters. Um, and the last thing is they are difficult to implement. Some of you might say, huh, we as smart people, we don't care whether it's difficult to implement. I argue it's actually a big thing because um, if it's easy to implement, you can play around with ideas, you can iterate over your research and get better results, um, which is actually not much done with the CRFs, with the fully connected CRFs. So my goal is to make CRFs great again. And to do this, I, produce, I propose uh, to introduce convolutional CFs. They are very fast, less than 30 milliseconds, which is 300 times as fast. Um, you can easily implement them in GPU using your favorite deep learning framework, PyTorch. And if you'd have done it, you can just optimize it as you would optimize any other neural network. So how do I do it? I do it by introducing a simple yet effective assumption. The assumption of conditional independence, I basically assume that the distribution of two pixels are conditionally independent if they are sufficiently far apart. In practice, this independence assumption essentially means my pairwise potential is zero if two pixels are a, k, a distance of k apart. k is a hyperparameter fixed before training, and we call k the filter size of the convolutional CF. I would argue that this is a, that my assumption is a valid and strong assumption. It is valid because it's based on the same locality assumption convolutions in CNNs are, are using, and they work incredibly well. It is a strong because it reduces the complexity of the pairwise potential from being quadratic to linear. So how does it fare in practice? In practice, this assumption allows me to implement CRF uh, highly efficient on uh, GPU. How is it done? It is essentially done very similar how you would implement 2D convolutions in CUDA or in GPU. It follows two steps. 
The first step is an operation which is referred to, sometimes referred to as im to call. Im to call essentially takes the input, tiles it up depending on the uh, kernel size, and um, puts it back to back together. It's a preparation operation for convolution, and it basically does all the memory operations a convolution need to do. Normal convolution would follow up with a matmul. Uh, for our basic operation, what we instead need to do is a sum product over all the um, filter dimensions. But as you can guess, doing this is highly efficient on GPU. Um, in the newest version of actually PyTorch, im to call is um, exposed in the Python API. So you can just implement these two lines as is in Python. Um, and after you've done this, you can easily train the whole thing and play around with it as you um, desire. Um, so let's have a look at some experimental results. For the first experiment, I uh, basically create some synthetic data by taking the actual label of an image. First downsample it quite a bit, then upsample it again in order to get some basically issues along the borders, add some noise, and then have my CFs clean up. Uh, it's worth to mention that for the first experiment, I don't apply any training. So full CF, the CFs don't have many parameters. The only parameters actually are the ones to balance, unary, and pairwise. And Kirian, Bull, and Carlton have some default suggestions for full CF, so I use the same parameters which are suggested by Kuehenberg and Carlton for full CF, for both full CF and con CF. The goal is to basically just compare the structure, and it's basically, I probably don't need to mention that it's a big advantage for full CFs. Despite this, uh, full CRF, uh, my con CF architecture beats the full CF quite a bit, and is much, much faster which is basically the main result. Um, I do some experiments on decoupled learning, which means first training CNN, and then apply a CRF to, full, uh, to basically refine it. DeepLab is, um, as I said, the software package which does it like uh, on GitHub, already has everything in it. So I can pair on the same unary DeepLab implementation, which does a quit search, with my conf CRF implementation, and uh, my conf CRF is slightly uh, better and much faster. I have some ablation studies. I think I can't really detail them uh, in here, but basically I play a bit around with learnable filters. As I mentioned, I think my approach is the first one which actually gets rid of the handcrafted features from Quay and Bull and which, uh, which is color and position, and learns them. I don't do too sophistic stuff, so basically my goal on this work is still to be as close as possible to the original uh, full CF to just have a good comparison. But um, basically learning filters is a good thing. Um, lastly, I do some experiments in end-to-end -end learning, meaning I plug CNN, then CRF, and I train everything um, from end-to-end. -end. Actually, this one is uh, kind of much less stable as a decoupled training, and my recommended mode for using CRFs is actually decoupled training because the end-to-end -end training because of the optimization inside the CNN, is very, very deep. So you have loads of vanishing query and stuff like this. Um, yeah, as a conclusion, I propose convolution CFs as a plug and play replacement for full CFs. So whenever you have, want to use full CFs, you can just use them. They are much faster, easy to optimize, and easy to implement. If you have any questions or discussions, please join me on a coaster and or check out my GitHub code. The GitHub code is very well liked by the community. It has already over 400 likes and 100 forks, so feel free to use it as a good start into your CIF research. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, do you have any questions? So uh, your evaluation results, are they based on these two images that you've shown here? Uh, no, uh, they are based on Pascal Vock, the oh. entire Pascal Vock data set. Okay, and uh, DeepLab has got many different nets and there is three versions of uh, DeepLab. Which one did you evaluate against? I think it was DeepLab V2 or V1. So essentially, um, I mean, I all, like, DeepLab has, is a huge package, it has the network, and some versions use a CRF. I basically just take the CRF, 
I ignore the rest of the code to make comparable, and I plug their CRF on top of my unary code. So I'm, I want to be as comparable as possible to my code, so it's basically, the correct uh, kind of pronoun would be to say it's deep lab CRF on top of my unary. Okay, so my question really is, I mean, you've taken this method from 2011, yeah. which was the state of the art in 2011, yes. but it's probably, and I'm guessing, it's probably far behind what we can do now with deep lab three plus and multi-resolution representations and all this. Uh, if it's not the case, please tell me. But um, so the question is, is it, I can see the value of that as a fast implementation of CRF, but does it actually improve uh, the state of the art in semantic segmentation? To be fair, I haven't done these kind of experiments. To, uh, I haven't tried to push for the state of the art because basically my goal was, uh, like, uh, CRFs are still being used um, in some of the applications I've mentioned. There was recently an ECCV paper where they've used CRFs for weekly, segment, weekly, uh, weekly um, labeled uh, segmentation. So my, my goal was to show, if you guys want to do, uh, use CRFs, use a much faster version. My goal was not to push for the state of the art in semantic segmentation. And, and do you think there is a scope to push for the state of the art? What's your feel? Yeah, like... It might be possible. Uh, like, yeah, um, basically, yeah, basically, what you could try is take whatever is state of the art and plug a CF on top of it and look whether you're better. There's a chance. Um, yeah, I haven't tried. Thank you. Uh, do you have any other questions or from the other room? Uh, hi, Ankit here. Okay. Hello. So, the previous question already mentioned about Deep Lab V3. I just wanted to ask you one thing here. Um, when I read DeepLab V3 Plus, I enc encountered something which was an improvement from um, their knife decoder. And in that knife decoder, there's just, what, what they actually do is, like in some slide you talked about um, lower level edges, right? Where the segmentation problems arise? Yes. Yeah, so here, what they do is, from the lower layers of the convolution, they took out the edges and the other such layers that depict all those things. And then that's how they fused, they upscaled it a little and then fused with the last layers. So if I may ask, like, did you ever try uh, thinking about these kind of stuff? Because I think your network has a good speed, but if you do this, it might really push the results further. Um, no, I didn't. Like, I've never played around with DeepLab V3. Again, kind of, the initial motivation of this work wasn't really to beat the state of the art in segmentation, and I'm sure there are many solutions to basically improve segmentation. So basically, the idea is CRFs are a widely used model, not only in vision, but also in languages and so on. And my kind of goal was to improve CRFs and um, as a first stage to basically speed them up and make them workable again. Like basically people stopped actually improving CRFs because they are so slow and difficult to implement. Um, and I found this kind of a good work and... Um, I hope some people can basically take these models and maybe get even fancier with architectures and try to do loads of things. And maybe they get state-of-the-art results. Maybe they get some other niche results like weekly supplement supervision. It's kind of, this is the goal to make this model work. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Thank the speaker again. Okay, and uh, our next speaker, Zulu Lee, yeah. uh, from uh, Pennsylvania State University, and she'll be speaking on group-based deep shared feature learning for fine-grained image classification. Hello, everybody. My name is Xue Luli. I'm from Pennsylvania State University. The title of our paper is Group-Based Deep Shared Feature Learning for Fine-Grained Image Classification. Uh, this is the content of my presentation. First, I will give you a brief introduction to fine-grained image classification. Fine-grained recognition involves classification within subordinate categories, such as different species of birds, different types of cars, or different variants of aircrafts. Uh, fine-grained image classification usually requires the proposed algorithm to discriminate highly localized attributes of objects while being environmented 
uh, invariant to their poses and locations in the images because they are always surrounded by very complex environments and uh, they always share a lot of uh, viral similarities. Although they share a lot of viral sim similarities, they are not having a lot of research <coughs> has been explicit modeling what is common or shared between different categories. And uh, we think this is a characteristic that we can utilize and can be helpful to improve the classification accuracy of uh, fine-grained images. In our proposed solution, we develop a deep learning-based methods with domain-based regular risers, and we try to model a shared feature patterns between the different categories in fine-grained images. First, I will show you some image samples of different birds from different species. Where we can find that such birds are always surrounded by very complex environments and have different poses and locations in the images. And uh, except for the body shape and the color of their beaks, they have so many similar uh, attributes around their body. And uh, what needs to be said is that uh, they always have uh, fungal images image data sets always have a large number of classes. They always have hundreds of different classes. There have been many related work proposed to solve the fine-grained image classification. Their common goal is to try to extract more discriminative features from such images. One direction is to try to extract the most localized attributes uh, feature of such objects in the images. The, sec the second direction is to try to extract more representative features by combining multiple different network structures. How, uh, in order to utilize the characteristic of that shared features for fine-grained images, uh, we propose our group-based deep shared feature learning method. The motivation behind our method can be illustrated in this figure, where Shapes with similar colors represent the feature components from the same class. For example, the pink diamonds and the dark uh, red triangles represent feature components from class one, and different shapes represent different kinds of feature components. For example, diamonds represent shared components and the triangles represent discriminative components. We find that by removing the shared components between class three and class four, class one and class two, the rest of the discriminative components can be better classified. And we also notice that there is no need to remove the shared components between class one and class three and class two and class four because there are no shared components. As a result, we can conclude that by dividing the different classes into different shared groups and removing the effects of these shared components within that group, by, and the rest of the discriminant components can be better to use to classify the fine-grained images, and as a result, the classification accuracy will be also improved. In order to achieve our goal, we propose our network structure. During the training process, the input images are fed into the feature extraction part of the net structure. This feature extraction part can mimic any feature extraction part of uh, networks. And uh, the output of the feature extraction part will be input to the classification part, where the encoder S is used to extract the shared components from the extracted features, and the encoder D is used to extract the discriminative components from the extracted features. The decoder is used to make sure that the output of encoder S and the encoder D can be reconstructed as the re extracted features to prevent the essential information loss during the training process. The classifier is used to assist the predicting labels of the input images. We should notice that only the output of encoder D will be used for classification, and uh, during the test process, only the part connected by the blue arrows will be stored for testing, which will save a lot of space. 
In order to make sure that every part of the net structure can play their own role, we propose our regularized loss function. The first is the classification loss, which is a cross entropy loss that is commonly used in different kinds of uh, image classification problems. And the second is the regularized loss function, which is the first proposed by our, uh, by our work. Uh, where include the class specific feature loss, which can make sure that the class specific, uh, uh, class uh, discriminative components to concentrate on the class specific feature center, and uh, the shared components to c concentrate on the shared feature center within its own group. Before the training process, we need to uh, separate the different classes into different shared groups. In our proposed method, we use a pre-trained network to extract features from each image, and we cluster these images into different groups using k-means clustering. Then we say each class belongs to the group where the most of the feature samples in the class are clustered to. And uh, the strategy for updating the class-specific feature center and the shared feature center are very easy. Uh, the update of the class specific feature center is similar as the uh, stochastic uh, gradient descent method. That is, we obtained the change of class specific, class specific feature center by averaging the discriminative components. And we use the scalar eta to adjust the learning rate of this specific, class specific feature center. Then we obtain the position of the shared feature center by averaging the class specific class-specific feature center within that shared group. Uh, the three data sets we use in our experiments are three benchmark data sets which are commonly used for fingering the image experiments. They, always have very, they all have very big class numbers and a very standard training test split. Here are some image samples from these three data sets. First, I will show you the benefits of group-based learning by giving you classification accuracy change with respect to the number of classes, but there is only one shared group, where we can find that the performance of our GSF net is much better than fine-tuning with GG16 network. We can also find that as the number of classes increases, the difference between VGGDs and the GSFL net become not that obvious. We think that because there is only one shared group, so as the number of classes increases, the, this effect from only one shared group will be not that obvious. We also give the epoch number required for convergence for these three methods. We notice that a GSFL net will require least the number of epochs to get to its best performance. Uh, then we give you GSFL net performance with respect to the number of groups. We can find that only by clustering the classes into different groups using the k-means before the training, we can obtain the best results. Then we give you different configurations of loss functions and their performances. Uh, we can find that only by using the three terms of the feature expression loss we propose that we can obtain the best performance, which means that every loss term is very important in our proposed loss function. Then we use the grad cam method to give a heat map of CDC uh, produced by the same layers of our proposed network and the VGG, net find VGG network. We can find that uh, the same layers of our proposed network can better concentrate the objects in the images. As a result, it can improve the performance of fine-grained image classification because that's an essential part of fine-grained image classification to find that most country, find that uh, attributes that can provide the most contribution in classification. Finally, because the specific network structure of our proposed method, it can be easily to it can be easily to combine with any of these state-of-the-art feature extraction structure, such as a compact bilinear CN and a kernel bilinear CN, to improve their performance to the extent to compare with almost any state-of-the-art fine-grained image classification method. Um, and uh, that's all. If you want to know more information about me, and my research includes all the codes of my research, you can scan this code to find my 
homepage and the other thing. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Do we have any questions? Yeah, there's one up here. Microphone. Hello. Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, can you come back, please, to the uh, slide where you show your architecture? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I would like to know, this label, is it a group label like cars or it's a fine grain label like it's a bird type 1, bird type 2? Uh, it's uh, at the end. This uh, J is a label of the group and C is a label of class. Okay, and after classifier, where is the labels? It's written labels. So uh, this is la with what kind uh, of... Sorry, this is the label of the class. I mean the label of the image. Okay, uh, so it's a specific bird or it's a just bird? Oh, sorry? It's uh, I mean, in this label, it's written bird type 1 or it's written just bird? Uh, it's, it's not a class-specific bird? Or it's, uh, it, it's, for example, we represent a, a bird from different classes as a 1, 2, 3, 4, such yeah, labels. Yeah, it's what I ask. So yeah, so labels will be... Uh, what, what the, yeah, one, two, three, four, like that. Yeah, yeah. like bird one. Okay, yeah. <laughs> thank you a lot. Thank That's you. Right. Uh, thank you. I have a question about the accuracy uh, table that you showed. Uh, could you? This one? Uh, no, no. Uh, the one that you had fixed classes 10, 20, and then there was... Oh, some... yeah. Yeah. Uh, is this the result of uh, one training, or you did separate trainings for like ten separate classes? Separate training. Separate trainings. Yeah. And what is the motivation for this? Like, um, uh, yeah, because we uh, we want to find, for example, VGDD is the GSF net uh, by removing the uh, shared feature rem uh, part, which means that in this uh, in this network structure, we only make sure that the discriminative components to concentrate on the class of specific feature center, but we didn't remove any shared feature pattern from these uh, extract features. So as a result, if the performance of VGGDs is similar as our proposed method, which means that uh, uh, by removing this shared feature pattern, you cannot get a lot of improvement. So we want to find that as the number of classes increases, whether the improvement of removing the a uh, shared feature pattern will be still that a lot or it will not be that obvious. And the results show that maybe that will not be very obvious as when we increase the number of classes. Okay, thank and that's you. It. You're welcome. Yeah, quick, quick one. Uh, just a very quick one. Could you go back to the diagram, please? A diagram, yeah. Yeah. By the way, very nice talk. Um, no, no, not the block diagram. The one that you've shown to my colleague, somebody asking there a question? Uh, oh, yeah. Of this, this one. This one. Yeah. Well, maybe I'm missing something, but how does the upper branch impact the lower branch here? Uh, upper branch, you mean? The uh, encoder, oh, yeah, 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 the encoder, and auto encoder. Uh, the, the encoder S is you to, for example, here we extract features from the input images, right? Encoder S is you to extract the shared components from these extracted features. And encoder D is you to extract the discriminative components from these extracted okay. features. But how do, you, how do you force it? I mean, uh, Yeah, so we propose our loss function here. Okay. This part is used to make sure that the discriminative components can be concentrating on the class-specific feature center. And the shared components to concentrating on the shared com uh, feature center. And since we don't know class specific feature center and the shared feature center before, we need to learn them during the learning process. Okay, and you update it. So you subtract somewhere this, uh, this class centers from, can you go back to the diagram again? Yeah. So how do you use the MOJ? Do you subtract it from somewhere? Or? MOJ, right? MOJ, yeah. Uh, yeah, MOJ, in fact, uh, yeah, I subject it. MOJ, uh, well, MOJ, in fact, uh, is a value we want. Uh, uh, sorry, there is a typo in this way. MOJ is, in fact, the MC I want to learn. Ah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. 
Okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, no, no, no. Uh, sorry, MLG is the SJ I want to learn because yeah, because I, I didn't change the represent here. Okay, so yeah. you subtracted during the learning. From, yeah, so yeah. there is a feedback. Yeah, okay. yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, do you have a quick question from the other room? No, nothing this time. No. Okay, thank you. From this uh, this session uh, by uh, Philip Harzig. Yes. Okay. Uh, from uh, the University of Augsburg. Augsburg, yeah. Yeah. Um, addressing data bias problems for chest x ray image report generation. Okay. Hello. Thank you for introducing me. My name is Philip Harzig. I'm from the University of Augsburg in Germany. And I'm addressing data bias problems for chest x ray image report generation. Uh, this is joint work with my colleagues over at FXPEL in Palo Alto, uh, California. Okay, uh, let's start with the motivation. So there's this one public data set about chest X-ray images that are um, associated with doctor's reports, written re re reports, paragraphs, that consists of 7,400 chest X-ray images. And as you can imagine, like the annotation requires expert knowledge. Doctors is very expensive and often has to comply with privacy regulations. So we have limited data, like that's very few images that are publicly available. So and oh, those reports mostly consist of normal sentences rather than abnormal sentences. And the problem with um, medical report generation or to identify something is that we that the abnormal cases are mostly more important. Um, and also uh, common machine translation metrics uh, that are used for this kind of task, uh, which is not a good idea in my opinion, uh, um, have some problems like uh, discriminating uh, those abnormal sentences because the paragraph is so long and most of the paragraph is normal sentences. And for imbalanced data set like this one, um, the normal cases get overweighted during the training, so more normal sentences are being generated. And that also results in uh, a less diversity of the generated paragraphs. So what we did uh, to counteract this issue, we first annotated the data set, so every sentence within this data set, uh, we annotated whether it's a abnormal sentence or a normal sentence. You can download it at the link below. Um, and also we use uh, those labels to train a hierarchical LSTM that we combined with a abnormality prediction module to reduce the data bias within this data set. And then further on we, we conducted an analysis uh, that shows uh, the correlation between machine translation metrics and the variability in those generated reports. And uh, we finally find that uh, the high score we calculate, or uh, other methods calculate, do not necessarily uh, ha are, have a good, good meaning, or do not something mean something you can rely on. Okay, um, I'm going to go shortly over the data set and explain our proposed model. So, like I said, it's the Indiana University chest X-ray data set. It contains only 4,000 rep reports because we mostly have two views of the chest, so the re reports are the same for those two views. And there are impression and findings, and those two textual reports we are concatenating and using as a ground truth. And there are also some additional uh, notation like those medical text indexer encodings, which are basically some keywords that were extracted automatically by the creators of the data set. Um, and th that's a small analysis, so we basically uh, took the paragraph, split it up into distinct sentences, and counted the number of appearances. And uh, as, as you would imagine, you see sentences like no pneumothorax, the lungs are clear, normal sentences appear with a very high frequency, like the lungs are clear, or lungs are clear appear like 1,200 times. And on the bottom right, you see abnormal sentences which only occur uh, with a frequency of one. And that's the important sentences we want to focus on. Um, and we use, uh, use a model that was proposed by Krause. Um Basically, that's a hierarchical LSTM. There's two LSTMs stacked on top of each other. 
And the first one generates so-called topic vectors, which are used as an initialization for the word LSTM, and the word LSTM then generates one sentence, and all, all those sentences are concatenated into a whole paragraph. Uh, there are other works who also use this hierarchical LSTM architecture to generate medical reports from those chest, ray, chest X-ray images. Um, and, but in contrast to those methods, we use two different words, word LSTM. Um, with our annotations we made, um, we are able to distinguish between abnormal and normal sentences, so we can use two different word LSTMs that generate uh, those respective sentences. Uh, that's just a short picture of, of our model. So we're using a ResNet 152 uh, to extract image features, and then in the, in, in the middle, uh, in the middle, the blue, there's the sentence LSTM, which generates the topic vectors, and topic vectors TM on the bottom is then given onwards to the word LSTM. But first, there's this abnormality prediction module, which is trained on our labels, whether it's an abnormal or normal sentence. And then the word LSTM, two different word LSTMs generate the respective sentences. And, and at the end, those sentences are concatenated. Um, so going on to the evaluation and results, um, we compare our models, which we call HLSTM dual and HLSTM attention dual, against the CNN RNN baseline, which was basically the show and tell model by Vinyas, and two other models, COAT and COP. Uh, but you have to consider that those two models use unknown data splits, and also they were pre-trained on a large Chinese data set on chest X-ray, which is private. Um, but we implemented a model similar to theirs and used it on our data split, which we call HLSTM and HLSTM attention. Um, also, we, uh, we do some things to select our models. Um, uh, we have two criteria. The first one is that uh, within all generated paragraphs, the first sentence, uh, if we look at the distinct sentences uh, of the first sentence, it should at least contain four different sentences. And then we choose the blue four score. If we only would use the blue four score, um, the variability of, those, of the generated paragraphs drops, uh, especially we found out that the highest scores we observed only had one distinct sentence, so it was generating the, the same paragraph all over again, and I think uh, uh, that's not a good thing to generate paragraphs. Um, okay, so our models are highlighted on the bottom, uh, HLSTM dual and HLSTM at dual. Uh, the first uh, scores are always on the validation set, and in the brackets we have uh, the scores on the test set. Um, our model HLSTM attention dual has the most improvement on CIDR, and it's also consistently better than the other models, our models, um, in Multigram Blue, Meteor, and Rouge L. Um, and also, we found out that the dual word LSTMs often have better scores than a single word LSTM. But what it boils down to actually is uh, the analysis on distinct sentences. Um, if you uh, look at the left hand side, uh, the green uh, graph shows the blue four score, and the solid line uh, represents uh, the highest score, the highest blue four score. And the blue and the orange lines uh, say the number of distinct sentences within all generated paragraphs, and we see that when selecting the model with the highest blue four score, we only get one distinct sentence for the first and or the second sentences. So basically, for every image in the test data set, the same paragraph gets generated, so that's not a good thing to do. And that's why we chose the second criteria, that we have a minimum number of distinct sentences, just like a model, which is the dashed line. And on the right-hand side, you see our addition, the dual word LSTMs, and then you can see that the number of distinct sentences grows more rapidly during training, and we get a higher variability in this course. But the blue four scores drop very rapidly when using the second evaluation criteria. Um, that's one example for a generated paragraph. I'm not going to read it because it will take too long, but it catches some of the, some of the things uh, written in the ground truth paragraph. Uh, so to come to the conclusion, uh, we proposed um, a hierarchical LSTM architecture 
uh, we expanded it uh, by a dual word LSTM, and then we introduced an abnormality prediction module which uh, lets us decide based on the topic vector whether to generate an abnormal or normal sentence. Uh, and those sentences are uh, generated independently. And uh, the main finding is that some of the other works, they basically do some score hunting and want to improve on, on, on the scores on those machine translation metrics. Uh, which uh, were not designed for generating doctor's reports. Um, uh, those metrics don't necessarily uh, are a good choice uh, when um, trying to find the best model possible for, uh, for generating such paragraphs. Um, yeah, that's basically it. Um, I want to thank you, uh, thank the guys at FXPAL who let me intern and yeah, thank you, you for being here until the last minute, and I'm here for questions. Okay, do we have any questions? Any questions from the other room? Or oh, there's one here. Just a quick question about the uh, performance table. You had some numbers in parentheses. Uh, is that uh, I couldn't understand? What's the difference between that? Is at, the, it... at the parentheses are uh, the scores on the on the test set, and the other ones are on the validation set. So we we selected our models on the validation set, and these are just the scores on the test set. I see. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, yeah. Is there anyone in the other room want to ask a question? No, there is nothing here. Okay, there's one uh, question down here. Um, oh, I've forgotten it now. <laughs> um, what was I going to say? Um, oh, yeah, so, um, so so you talked about this sort of uh, long tail distribution yeah. with regards to sort of abnormal um, Diagnoses versus uh, yeah, nor or, yeah, regular kind of descriptions. Yeah. Um, was d did you find you needed to within those abnormal descriptions? Did you need to uh, do anything additional to deal with the sort of like long tail within that, or were they pretty evenly distributed within the sort of like uh, abnormal cases? So basically, uh, what we found there are many abnormal. Um, um, Sentences, but uh, they are so different, and, and the frequency is so low. So uh, I didn't tell you that, but 78% of the distinct sentences have a frequency of less than three. And yeah, uh, within the data set, like more than half of the cases are actually abnormal cases. But the sentences itself, so m m most most. Uh, uh, most paragraphs start with uh, the hardest normal in size, the lungs are clear, so there are so many uh, normal sentences which uh, which uh, turns the machine learning uh, methods into just only generating those normal sentences and don't paying attention to, to the other ones. So the other ones, the abnormal sentences are, are balanced quite evenly. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and if there's any other questions, I'll thank the speaker again.